So now that we've gone over all the facts of the Rangdan Xenocides, now I get to have a schizophrenic meltdown and get to go over some of my favorite theories I came across while researching. I'll also be going into how it's supported by the lore, and I'll be ranking them on coolness, creativity, as well as how likely they are to show up in the setting. Now, you can't talk about the Imperium without talking about Rome. The inspiration for a lot of the style and literature for the early Imperium, and even in modern times with the Ultramarines, I won't go into the Blueberry Boys, but my favorite example of the Roman Empire being the Imperium and vice versa is the Rangdan Xenocides. We know that the three Rangda Wars are based off from the Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage. We also know that each one of the wars represented a different stage in the development of the Roman Navy. So the Indomitus class battleship crashing into the Battle Moon on Advex Mors Primus was was a direct example of how the Romans initially used stolen designs and adapted them later on to the Roman strategy. The Romans in this case had copied the design of a Carthaginian quinquiron, which was a type of small galley ship, specifically a ramming ship, that they would attach a battle ladder to, which would compensate for their shit naval capabilities. My favorite metaphor of the first Rangdan Crusade is exactly that, the Indomitus class battleship crashing into the battle moon was the writer's way of not directly saying, hey look, it was Rome, but yeah, they could slide it in pretty sly. To say that the Romans at the start of the Punic Wars sucked at naval combat was an understatement. They had relied extremely heavily on the ram and board strategy during the first two Punic Wars, much like how the Imperium loves to send boarding torpedoes so that their super soldier Astartes and specifically trained naval armsmen can board the ship and clear it with more precision than any munition that the Imperium fields. Now this may be my inner English teacher speaking now, but the Rangdan Xenocides are my absolute favorite metaphors for the Roman Empire, especially since the first Xenocide was essentially just the Imperium learning combined arms void combat at a great cost, and learning how to fight absolute masters of void combat, who also conveniently outmaneuvered the Imperium and disregarded all life that wasn't deemed important by a higher power. The Second Punic War was when an absolutely massive naval force arrived on the Roman doorstep, and both empires nearly collapsed just fighting the war. Neither economies could keep up with the sheer scale of the conflict for the time. With Rome building itself completely around militarism, it had weathered the storm far better. And the Third Xenocide, or Punic War in this case, was when the Romans followed the Carthaginians home and absolutely slaughtered them. So to continue comparing the Rangda and the Carthaginians, both sides' commanders fought absolutely vicious battles with zero regard for them or their men's life because, especially in the case of Carthage, if you failed and you lived, you may as well just not come back. Coming back as a failure to Carthage means that you were killed on the spot, taking a page right out of Perturabo's book. But for the time being, I will put my inner English teacher aside, put him right over on the shelf over there, and we can stop comparing the Xenocides and the Punic Wars and stop talking about metaphors. English class is behind us. Starting with speculation, and all of this is in no particular order, we have the most bare bones of all of the theories. We have the Rangda just discovered a flaw in the Primarchs of the Astartes, much like uh, foe and his Astartes killer virus, or maybe they were able to mind control the lost Primarchs. Neither Chaos nor the Imperium would want to acknowledge that or let that information get out. Sadly, I have to rank this a 3 out of 10 because it is extremely boring. Uh, it's also super hard to disprove, it's got no substance, and there's no, no depth. One of the most popular theories in the community is one or both of the missing Primarchs found out that they were made out of warp sauce and started trying to ascend to godhood. Chaos and the Emperor don't want any more big players in the warp, so they try to keep it under wraps. Decent, since we do know that they discovered about the psychic weapons used by the Emperor, but this would also explain the two Primarchs and not their legions, since we know that the Ultramarines conveniently got a massive increase in both manpower and material, which, no, that's not weird. The Ultramarines having a legion size of almost 300,000 makes perfect sense. Ultramar is a realm with 500 worlds. No other legion could maintain that level of consistent, high-quality recruits, since they have damn near a quadrillion imperial souls within Gilliman's personal segmentum. This one gets a 7 out of 10 for being a really cool idea, but sadly I don't think it's very likely, so it gets a 3 in that aspect. My absolute favorite theory is that the Rangda, the Sloth, and the Enslavers are all technically one species, with the Sloth being like the Hunters in Halo worms that can come together to form something that is significantly more than the sum of its parts. 
Since we already know that during the scouring of Advex Moors, there were multiple different phenotypes, and with how similar they looked, the different phenotypes of the Rangda in this case would be essentially juvenile or adolescent colonies that hadn't right quite reached the maturity level that the Sloth have. This would also explain why the Sloth are damn near extinct now, as all of their younglings have been culled. Personally, I love this one. It gets a 10 out of 10 for creativity. It's my favorite theory, but I really don't think GW is going to do anything with it. The most boring and simple theory that also is well liked among the community is that the Rangda were simply a peaceful federation of humans and Xenos that refused the Imperial will. This wouldn't be too far of a stretch since we already know of the Interrex, the Solemnar cult, the Capiculu Continuum, the list goes on. All of them more or less received the same size 80 Oromite boot in their ass from the Emperor one way or another. This one gets a 0 out of 10 for creativity because it's just taking another story and making it this one, but sadly it is one of the most likely, so it gets a 6 in that aspect. One of the more likely ones is that the Rangda were simply a species of psychic nulls, or blanks. We know that the Sloth are negative warp entities, and we know that the Rangda had complete control of multiple species by some means, even though it's still pretty clear that it was some sort of nerve stapler or mind control collar. Together, along with a few other particularly nasty races, they formed a coalition or some sort of alliance based solely off of slave labor of the lesser races. Some of the races that we saw through the Xenocides who would appear to work with or for this Federation are the base mechanic, the enslavers, and the hellspawn void forms. This gets an 8 for creativity and a 5 for how likely we are to see it, as this would actually explain a lot of the quote unquote cooperation of the Sloth and the Rangda. The last theory that I'm going to mention posits that the Sloth were actually the real powerhouse of the Rangda, and that after the horrifying losses of their entire armada in the second Xenocide, the Sloth outright abandoned them, deeming them unworthy, and just allowing them to completely fade out of existence. I give this one an 8 for creativity and a 4 for likeliness. Even though this one isn't a far stretch, since they literally mind control everyone and everything at any opportunity, but still, it's not very likely. I feel like a really good spot to end this whole series on is with the quote that really inspired me to make this whole series. Um, this is a passage from the Horus Heresy Black Book number 7, Inferno, from page 133. Forbidden to all, save one. The exact genesis of the experiments which led to the creation of the Ordo Sinister is difficult to pin down by scholarly observers in this latter age. As with almost all that began in the prohibited vaults of the Emperor's own laboratory complex beneath the Imperial Palace on Terra, its nature remains sealed by time and by the destruction that was to follow. Such records that do remain within the Martian Mechanicum, however, who, given the nature of the Ordo Sinister's origins, were seriously perturbed by the project, or more accurately, their exclusion from it, do evidence certain speculations that it was arrived at either as a tangent of what was to come the Emperor's greater work in the control and manipulation of the Psyker Factor in human evolution, or as a direct attempt to develop esoteric weaponry on the macro scale to combat certain encountered menaces which had proven terrible in the cost of their destruction. These menaces, such as the Enslaver Alpha Incursions, the Rangdan Asiavors, and the Hellspawn Void Forms, all of which had taken the lives of millions of soldiers and thousands of star vessels to combat, and had broken whole expeditionary fleets and titan legions in the past, were menaces to which no sure counter existed, save that of Exterminatus. The purpose of what became the Ordo Sinister was the battlefield employment of macro-level weaponry, of terrible potency, and of a nature which was expressly forbidden to any within the Imperium be they Primarch or Planetary Governor, on pain of death. These were weapons born of the Dark Age of Technology, and perhaps ancient relics of civilizations which had risen and fallen before life had even begun on primeval Terra. Weapons forbidden to all but those under the Emperor's direct shadow and control, and even then only under the greatest possible conditions of secrecy and failsafe. The Ordo Sinister was the cadre set up to build, maintain, and use these weapons, classed, as their name suggests, Sinistrum. This word has long stood as the Terran Tech Arcana classification for prohibited technologies designed to artificially amplify or weaponize the Psyker's gift, usually at the cost of the Psyker themselves, body or mind. 
and examples such as the Kulexine shackles used by the narco-enslaved Psyker covens of the Caucasus waste subjected by the Emperor during the Unification Wars had long since been bywords for the evil of the Dark Age of Technology.